Hey creeps, welcome back. I hope you're doing well. And if you have as much snow as we do here in Ohio, I hope you are staying warm. So my goal in 2021 is to read at least 10 books a month. So it doesn't matter if the book is long, short, audiobook, comic, it doesn't matter. Just as long as I read 10 a month. And I started out the year very strong. I read a total of 21 books in the month of January. Honestly, I think that's the most I've ever read in a month before. So it felt really good. I felt very productive and I read some great books. So today I'm gonna to be talking about all of the horror books that I read. Starting off, we have a middle grade horror book called Don't Call at All by Robbie Miles. This is kind of an ode to Goosebumps. Don't Call at All follows a boy named Jesse Davidson who is obsessed with wanting a phone. His parents won't let him have one, but everybody at school has a phone and he desperately wants one. And then Jesse meets a strange man on the streets and this guy is all messed up. He's like skeletal, his skin is hanging off, he's got like pussy boils all over and he's just he's seen better days and this man gives jesse a phone free of charge and jesse cannot believe it and he's a little weirded out but he takes the phone anyway just because he wants one so much and of course this phone isn't a normal phone and jesse soon discovers that and i thought this was a really fun read it is basically a modern day Goosebumps that involves more technology than the original series did. Only this adds in a whole lot of body horror, which wasn't too prevalent in the Goosebumps series. That They had elements of that, but this really goes for it. This gets very gross and goopy, which I really enjoyed and I think kids are gonna like because I work with kids on the bookmobile and I know kids like gross stuff. And I know when I was a kid, I liked gross stuff too. I would check out those Ripley's Believe It or Not books and even though repulsed me to look at the images. I still couldn't look away. So I think this book definitely has that going on. Now I will say that Robbie Miles is a friend of mine. I met him on Instagram a couple of months ago and he offered to send me his book for a review. So I got this in the mail and this is the advanced reader copy. Um, I saw that the book needed a little bit of help when it came to formatting. So I went ahead and offered to do it for him for free. So the actual finished paperback is formatted by me, but even though I did that, and even though Robbie is a friend of mine, that doesn't change the way I feel about the book. I'm always gonna give you my honest opinions. And overall, I thought this was a good time. I never lost interest in the book a single time. In fact, I finished it in one sitting, but I am really excited to get my hands on a finished copy of this book. So that way I can see, you know, what it looks like in print. This was just a good time. Being a Goosebumps lover and loving Goosebumps as a kid, this really brought me back to my childhood. It just made me feel like I was reading a Goosebumps book again. So definitely earns my seal of approval. This isn't like great literature by any means. This is pretty much what you would expect from a Goosebumps throwback. So don't expect anything like out of this world, amazing, super scary or anything like that. It's just meant to be what it is. And I think Robbie Miles did a great job with that. I'm really looking forward to reading more of his work and also love that cover art by Cameron Rubik, which just happen. I don't know how this keeps happening. Of course, Cameron Rubik did the cover art for my book. He did the cover art for Local Haunts, which I have a story in. Didn't plan for that to happen. He did the cover art of another anthology that I am now going to have a story in. And he did the cover art of Robbie's book, who happens to be a friend of mine. Didn't even know that until the cover was announced. So it's just really weird how the stars align like that. So there you go. That's what I thought about Don't Call It All by Robbie Miles. I gave it four stars and I will post the link down below in the graveyard where you can order a copy for yourself. Speaking of goosebumps, I did pick up a few R.L. Stein books in the month of January. The first one is a point horror book from 1993 and that is The Dead Girlfriend by R.L. Stein. Love the cover art on that. Super cool. All of the covers on the point horror books are amazing. Annie just met Jonathan. She doesn't know about his last girlfriend, doesn't know how beautiful she was, doesn't know how popular, doesn't know how she died. But Annie is about to find out because Jonathan's old girlfriend might be dead, but she isn't gone. And this makes it seem like it's a supernatural kind of story. It really isn't. You're just trying to figure out who killed his girlfriend. There are a few instances where you think, oh, is his girlfriend coming back from the grave or not? But those are just the 
tropey false twists that R.L. Stein always does at the end of his chapters. So there's a lot of those, <laughs> be warned going in. I'm sure if you've read R.L. Stein, you already know what to expect. Overall though, this was just a really cozy book, very summery. <laughs> Makes me wish this snow would melt so that way we can get to summer already. The main character goes on a lot of bike rides, which makes me want to get on my own bike. So if anything, this book just made me want summer even more. But yeah, this was fun. I think I gave this three stars. I also read a couple of Fear Street books. Now I've been reading a lot of young adult horror lately, especially the vintage young adult horror. And there's a reason for that. I always read a lot of young adult horror as a kid and as a teenager, and I've read it here and there throughout my adulthood. But I have a certain project that I'm working on and it requires me to do some research. So that's the reason why you're gonna be seeing a whole lot of young adult horror books this year in my wrap ups. Also, now I just have a reason to read 90s young adult horror, which is always fun. So this one is The New Boy, and the tagline on this is, he was a hunk of trouble. It's one thing I love about Fear Street books are the taglines. The, the one on the back says, he stole their hearts. Does he want their lives too? What a hunk. When handsome, mysterious Ross Gabriel comes to Shadyside High, all the girls want to date him, even the ones who already have boyfriends. Janie, Eve, and Faith go as far as to make a bet. Which one of them will he go out with first? But then the murders begin, and it starts to look like dating Ross means flirting with a gruesome and untimely death. Will Janie's dream date with Ross turn out to be the night of her life or the night of her death? This was so much fun. I really enjoyed this book. R.L. Stein is just a master at pacing, and that is very much a strong point here in this book. It's very short and it moves along very quickly, and there was never a point where I wanted to put the book down. In fact, this is another one that I read in a single sitting. Uh, just so good, and there's actually some instances of really good writing throughout. It's not something that I, I expect from R.L. Stein. He's a good writer in terms of pacing and storyline and plot, but when it comes to his prose, it's it's just very readable, it flows really well. But there were some very well-written passages of this book that surprised me. And also there's one scene in particular with really great suspense that involves Janie in a house alone with the stalker. And I have to say, it did have me in suspense. So, The New Boy, really good Fear Street book. The next one I read was the Dare. Johanna Wise has always longed to be part of Dennis Arthur's rich, popular crowd, and she can't believe it when he finally asks her out. Now she'll do anything to continue to hang out with his cool friends and keep Dennis as her boyfriend. So when Dennis dares her to kill their teacher, Mr. Northwood, she doesn't say no. She can't. Besides, it was only a joke, right? But now the joke has gone too far and the whole school is taking bets with Joanna. The dare is serious, dead serious. Will she do it? Will she really kill for love? This addition to the Fear Street series is very simple, as most of the Fear Street books are, and I liked it overall. It was really fun. It's another one that I read in a single sitting. I really liked the writing style of this one. I thought uh, Joanna was a very fun character to get in the head of because she's a little bit unhinged. And she has a lot of very dark, strange, warped fantasies that involve beating people up and killing people. So of course this does lead to a lot of Arl Stein's uh, false cliffhanger chapter endings where you think something's happening and oh, it's not actually happening. But it kind of worked in this case just because Joanna does have all of these dark fantasies and it makes you believe, yeah, this girl could probably actually kill her teacher for love. Uh, it was fun. It's not my favorite Fear Street book, but I did have a good time with it. Another vintage young adult horror book that I read is number seven in the Nightmare Club series. This is Sleigh Ride by Nick Barron. This series was actually new to me. I do own most of the series, but I hadn't read any of them. Now, this was published by Z Fave in the 90s, and Z Fave was an imprint of Zebra Books. So I'm gonna pull a book off my shelf so you can see these vintage uh, zebra horror paperbacks, the same company that did the Nightmare Club series. So I started this at the end of December, thinking I would read it for Christmas, and it wound up going into January a bit. So I wound up finishing this in January. Didn't really know what to expect when I started reading it. Uh, I know the zebra books are kind of hit or miss, usually miss, so I was expecting this just to be just a trashy good time. 
what I got was actually a very heavy, dark story that really surprised me. There was only one holiday present Andrea really wanted for Tom Markham and his jock bullies to disappear. Then she wouldn't have to be the victim of their humiliating comments and cruel pranks. Andrea knows it's sexual harassment, but no one takes her seriously. She wishes there was some way to make them stop, and soon she gets her wish in a big way. One by one, Tom and his friends begin to die, murdered at the hands of a mysterious guardian angel. Andrea is terrified. The sleigh ride has gotten out of control, and there's no way to stop it. This was dark, grim, violent, not necessarily a fun book to read, but I feel like this would have been a very popular, controversial book had it not been published as number seven in the Nightmare Club series. I don't think very many people actually ended up reading this, but had it been published on its own as its own standalone young adult book, I think this would have definitely stirred some stuff up because this is very much about sexual harassment in the school and taking place in 1993. Of course, people didn't usually do things about sexual harassment. You could go to the principal and nothing would be done. And that really plays a part in this book. It's very much about people standing by and watching all of this happening, but not actually doing anything. But of course, when Andrea begins to get these notes from her guardian angel and pranks begin to happen, she starts to feel a little more confident, a little bit better about herself. Because it doesn't start out with murder, it actually starts out really small. It starts out with the, the pranks that these bullies were pulling on Andrea. And now they're kind of getting a taste of their own medicine and the attention is being put on to these guys and it's being taken off of Andrea, and Andrea begins to feel very confident, and the people who used to stand by and not stick up for Andrea are now feeling stronger themselves and start standing up for her. Of course, this just makes the harassers even angrier, and they start plotting some very dangerous, cruel things against Andrea, and that's when this guardian angel steps in and starts taking lives into their hands, and it gets very brutal. I was surprised that this book actually went for it. And there's actually a really great scene where Andrea goes to the principal's office and confronts him. And he doesn't do anything about it, but Andrea has just read a book about sexual harassment and she knows how to respond. And it's a very satisfying scene. It's one of those scenes that I think would have been really helpful for people to have read back then. But unfortunately, I think a lot of people missed this book. But there's also a really good section at the end that is a know your rights section. And it basically goes over what to say, how to handle a situation if somebody at your school is sexually harassing you, or if people are not doing anything about it, how do you tell somebody? And if they don't do anything about it, what should you say to them to make them do something about it? I won't say this is one that I will recommend to just anybody. I think this is a really fascinating book of its time. Um, I would not recommend this to sexual assault victims at all because this is really dark and grim and would not bring back good memories. But if you are into young adult fiction and especially young adult horror, but you still want something a little different, this was pretty good. Next up, I read What's Wrong with Valerie by D.A. Fowler. This is a new reprinted edition from Capricorn Literary. This was originally printed in 1991. So it is a vintage horror book that is now back in print. This is a very interesting book about a young woman named Valerie who has some issues. After the death of her hated grandmother, Valerie is for the first time in her life really free. The house belongs to her. She should be happy, but Valerie isn't quite normal. She's taking in roommates to make ends meet, but one by one, they keep ending up dead. Her young niece is crying out for a special kind of discipline that only she can provide. And there's the voices she hears, voices that want her to do terrible things. Valerie is only trying to survive. If she stops doing what the voices tell her, something grotesquely evil will devour her soul. What's wrong with Valerie? I do have a full video review about this, which I'll post right up there. You can go see what my thoughts were, but overall, loved this book. This was fan-freaking-tastic. 
I also read a couple of comic books. The first one is Graveyard Slaughter, number one. Uh, it says number one, but there aren't any more volumes in the series, and I don't think there's going to be, at least it doesn't seem like there will be. And this is about a video store called Video Hell in the 80s, and basically it's a Tales from the Crypt style anthology where you have this overarching setting of Video Hell, and then this young girl who keeps bringing back these mysterious videotapes and returning them to the video store, except they don't seem to really belong to the video store. And then each story is a peek into what these videos are. I actually got this in a Nightworms package a year or two ago, and I thought this was okay. Wasn't great though. I loved the setting of the comic. Video Hell is awesome, but I wanted more of that and we just get teeny tiny little glimpses at the video store. And then as for the stories themselves, they were very short. There wasn't a whole lot to them. I feel like they could have been a little more fleshed out like the original EC comics, Tales from the Crypt, Vault of Horror. Those stories were really short. They still have this, this feel about them that made them feel like I ate like a whole story. These were just like little snippets of scenes that seem to be slapped together into a single book. Also, while the artwork is solid throughout the entire book, there are different artists for each and every story, and the artwork doesn't always go together. There's really no sense of continuity, so that did bother me a bit. It was a little bit jarring. I feel like it could have been better than it was. I wound up only giving this, I think, two stars. I also read a book called Apocalypse Taco by Nathan Hale. Now, we got this on the bookmobile. I hadn't heard of it before. Uh, I just kind of picked it up because I thought the title sounds fun. And holy crap, this was not what I was expecting from a children's graphic novel. This follows a group of kids who are staying late at the school because they're part of the theater group and they're rehearsing and getting ready for the play and they decide to make a really quick taco run. So they go to the nearest fast food Mexican restaurant and something's not right. Things begin to go really weird in their town and as they drive back to the school, they find that they are caught in this really strange apocalypse where nacho cheese is basically devouring everything and things are melting, people are melting, and it gets weird and trippy and there's a ton of body horror and a lot of Junji Ito style uh, illustrations here that just got under my skin. Apocalypse Taco was really weird and I liked it. I also listened to a few audiobooks. So the first one I'll talk about is Halloween by Curtis Richards. This of course is the novelization of John Carpenter's original film. I just did a really big video all about Halloween movie tie-in novelizations. So I will link that right up above me. You can see my review of Halloween by Curtis Richards in that video. Please, please go give it a watch. I worked really hard on that video. It took me two whole days, at least 10 to 12 hours of filming and editing. It took a long time and I'm really glad how it turned out. It's I think something different and special for this channel. I also listened to The Vampire Lestat by Anne Rice. Of course, Interview with the Vampire is one of my favorite books of all time, but I had never really read any of the other books in the series. So I listened to The Vampire Lestat and I really liked it. I will say it's not quite as good as Interview with the Vampire in my opinion. I felt like Anne Rice's writing can be a little repetitive and go on for a little bit too long to where it did lose me on many occasions. It wasn't my favorite. I think I wound up giving this three stars. I might have given it four. And lastly, I listened to the audiobook of Parish by L.C. Barlow. This is the second book of the Jack Harper series. I listened to the audiobook of Pivot by L.C. Barlow, which was the first book in the Jack Harper series. I listened to that a couple of months ago and I did a big review, so I'll post that up there. Pivot, the first book, follows a young girl named Jack Harper who is being raised in a cult. And this girl is not just being raised to worship a wicker basket or anything. Cyrus, the cult leader, has been raising Jack since she was just a really young girl to go and kill for him. She basically does all of his dirty work and he manipulates her into doing this by telling her that whenever she kills people, he has the ability to bring them back from the dead. So when she kills them, they aren't dead forever. They won't stay dead. He can bring them back. Therefore, death isn't final. It's not like she has to worry about it or anything. She's not actually doing anything wrong. And he 
does kind of have the ability to bring people back. It's not necessarily a lie. He's just not going to bring them back. That's why he wants them dead. There are a lot of paranormal elements about this series, a lot of science fiction elements worked in, and it is also dark. It is so, so dark. Pivot was one of my favorite books that I read last year, and it was also one of the darkest books that I read. And uh, we're just continuing right on with the darkness with Parrish picks up right where the last book left off. So I don't really want to say anything about the book because I don't want to spoil the sequel or anything about the first book, but it was great. I really loved how Elsie Barlow continued on with the series. I don't feel like this book suffers from that sophomore slump at all. While the first book is a little bit more contained and we're just kind of at the heart of the cult, seeing it all from Jack's point of view, the sequel opens things up a bit more. We see the larger picture and the scope of everything that's going on. I think I gave four stars to Parrish while I gave five to the first book, so it's not quite as good as the first book, but it's, it's close. It's very, very close. Now, there are a couple of books that I started reading in January that I haven't finished yet. I'm gonna be finishing them this month, so you'll get to see my overall view about these books in the coming wrap-up video. But I started reading Devil's Night by Curtis M. Lawson, and I got about halfway through Spectre of Springwell Forest by Simon Dillon. I'm going to be talking a lot more about these books in uh, my coming wrap-up. And I think I'm going to do an individual review about Devil's Night because this book is awesome so far. Anyway, those are all of the horror books that I read in the month of January. I hope you guys had as strong a reading month as I did. And I will catch you in the next episode of Library Macabre. Eager creeps. Thank <laughs> you.